Welcome back, everybody. Obviously, um, big shout out, congratulations again to um, Brett and Wayne this mm -hmm. year for the Roar stuff. We wanted to talk to you a little bit about negotiation tips. Yeah, and uh, sitting here, I actually thought of a, a real quick story. I'm not sure if I'm qualified for this <laughs> uh, based on this morning's uh, events. And I think we can all learn something from negotiating with three-year-olds. Oh gosh, I can't even imagine. I'm so, not, I need more, way more years of practice uh, for that. Uh, I was a little bit late this morning and largely in part to um, Gibson was trying to wear sweatpants and we don't want him to be that kid that's always in sweatpants. <laughs> so we spent quite a while, I was trying to negotiate jeans and then he went from sweatpants to shorts and it's going to be a little bit too cold for shorts so we spent some time negotiating on shorts and then I reverted to bringing sweatbacks back into it and we agreed to meet in the middle at sweatpants. <laughs> Um, I feel so, like khakis are like yeah. a bit of a sweatpanty <laughs> yeah. type thing. So, you could have. Uh, I lost jeans. He won sweatpants. I don't know if I should be <laughs> talking say, about that. Yeah, he won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's too funny. And, it, and it's true. And one of the things that we don't think about, and this is the way I always start my negotiation course too, um, day six of our bachelor program, which is coming up uh, in a couple weeks, uh, is in a few weeks actually, is going to be on contracts and negotiation. And, and clients use this as, uh, when, when realtors talk to clients, it's one of the biggest things that people talk about as a realtor's big benefit is that you have the power of a strong professional negotiator. Um, yet some of you have never actually taken negotiation courses. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that your skills are up there. But to Steve's point, everything in life is negotiable. Mm -hmm. This deal that you guys are doing with your clients is negotiable, but also you have vendors, um, you know, home inspectors, photographers. If my photographer, if I agree to use them for every single one of my listings and they're not providing me some kind of discount, um, I think I want to talk about that. And I agree that I will use them for my listings as my exclusive photographer, and they give me a bit of a benefit. Same thing with my inspector, use them for all the inspections, and they give my clients a bit of a break. So everything in life is negotiable, even your commitments when you're gonna get back to people, things like that. So don't forget that um, at any point in the time. But obviously today we're focusing on the transaction itself. Right, uh, and in my opinion, the negotiations in real estate, um, when you're on the, the buying side, start right from the showing request. Yeah, take us through that, what do you mean? Yeah, uh, it's getting a little bit more challenging with showing time where, rather than being able to call the agent and, and talk with them. Uh, but uh, it's funny how different mindsets happen through different stages uh, with realtors and, and you can often get more information that's gonna benefit your clients when it's the first showing request rather than when we're presenting an offer, what's your possession date? Yeah, then they're like, down. Yeah. that's right, yeah. Um, but if you start chatting the, with the realtor when it's uh, the showing request, they're trying to get you into an offer situation. So they're a little bit easier to, to get some information on. A little bit looser lipped on that. Yeah. And the other thing too is that when you do your research and you're, you're researching to get as much information as possible, um, asking tons of questions starts right from the beginning. And the only way that you can meet somebody's goals, i.e. the seller's goals and your buyer's goals, is by knowing a whole bunch of stuff about them. If you do find out that this, um, that this seller has a, a move date, they're trying to line up with a build, mm -hmm. well, that's a little bit of negotiation power for you. If you can give them their possession date, they might be a little bit more flexible in other terms. Or you find out this person happens to be a contractor themselves or something. Oh, they, you know, they developed their own basement and they have all the permits, this guy is a contractor then maybe you can get a deck built or a fence or something or fixed by a professional contractor who is a seller and he's willing to do it at his cost right. for a much less expensive. And there's all these other possibilities in here that you can add more value to the transaction um, by understanding where this person sits in their situations. Agreed, and that's also coming back to the first showing and going through the home and getting to know the people that actually live in that home a little bit totally. by what's around and maybe you find out they're a contractor because they'll have their, their journeyman certificate posted or yeah. maybe you find out they're an engineer so maybe they've been laid off. Like, yeah. <laughs> you never know. You can never be hurt by having more information. Right. And, and so you always, always want to do that. Um, Steve, talk about, you also talked about educating your clients. Tell us, tell us, tell us about that a little bit. Um, preparing your clients for an offer situation is always going to benefit you through an offer situation. Um, so again, when this works both buyers and sellers uh, side, but always preparing your clients for, I like a three price strategy. Um, That's interesting. Tell us about that. So when you, let's talk about buyers. When you sit down with your buyer and uh, you want to do your market evaluation and come up with, 
uh, what the most that they're possibly willing to pay for this property if we run into a multiple offer situation, and then you explain how multiple offer situations work. You got one shot. Um, and then you ask them what they feel market value is based on the research that you guys just reviewed together. And then the third one is what they think the steal of a deal price is. Nice. And then you f formulate your strategy around these three prices, but you're prepared for anything to come out of the woodwork. So if you're t only talking about the steal of a deal price and all of a sudden they got to switch to a multiple offer price, they're not going to be that receptive to that. Uh, but you can switch gears a lot quicker in a negotiation strategy if everybody's well prepared. Yeah, and, and, and knows what to expect. And just like, you know, even with your sellers coming in, prepare them when you hear about an offer that this offer might be low. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people get so excited. Oh, guess what? Are you guys around tonight? Well, an offer's coming in and your clients are all excited. They're, you know, pouring the glass of wine, getting ready. And this thing is a non-starter because of the offer um, that you have. But, you know, also always, like the fact that someone, I just want to make this point, this isn't on our list, but some of the, the fact that a buyer took the time to sit down, go through it, mm -hmm. write an offer, means that they're actually a bit serious. Yeah. Even if the offer comes in low, they might just be shooting for the moon or trying to test the waters here, but they, they are very, very, um, you know, they're very serious. No one just wants to waste time mm -hmm. writing an offer. If you got an email from someone saying, oh, would they accept 410 on a $500,000 property? Then you know it's not serious. But if they sat down, all the forms are filled out, everything else, like someone took time on this. Yeah. So, so be aware of that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to say back to your preparation, I love your three pricing. And I'm going to jump one of our thoughts later on here, um, bump it up a little bit because we talk about this concept of um, two offers. Right. And when you prep somebody as well, you can find out what's important to your client. Is it price? Is it the terms? Is it the possession date? Is it that um, piece of furniture they want left in? Is it uh, that the renovation gets done in a certain way, finishing up? You always have like the price and the terms, and it's not always about one or the other. So one of the things you're able to do is prepare sort of a two offer mentality. And sometimes you can even have two offers in a counter, mm -hmm. and the, the two offers comes in and you say, okay, here's one offer that has um, your price, except we want our possession date, we want these three pieces of furniture, we want this, this, and this, or you can have um, our price and you get to keep all of these. Right. And it's like the, the, the seller now has two different options there to make a choice from, and it puts you a little bit back in the driver's seat. I love that when you're getting close through a negotiation and then you, you kind of know where their sweet spot is, you know where you're at, and then you can do that two offers, and it works really well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, knowing your goals, and we were talking about that, uh, preparing an offer in a way that you're giving, willing to give up something to get what you want. Um, this is all in offer preparation, and it's really knowing, knowing your client's goals and what they want, and then throwing some stuff in there that you're going to be willing to negotiate or even throw out completely because it doesn't mean anything. Um, but you really want to bring attention back to um, the main points that you guys need to achieve. You know, there's this concept of uh, the red herring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, way back when, when they used to try to smuggle in uh, immigrants and um, drugs and other nefarious goods, what they would try to do is pack a whole bunch of red herring fish on top of the load so that it would throw off the search dogs. And so they thought it did, and because the stench of the red herring is so strong. So the concept of red herring in an offer is that you put something else in there to draw the attention away from that item that you really want. Now, I am not a fan of games in negotiation. Um, I don't like trickery. I don't like people trying to manipulate people. But there's always some showmanship here because there is this natural dance that you will play. And I really recommend that you know, if you're going to try to get what you want by throwing in a bunch of stuff, I mean, you might throw in and, um, or you counter on a deposit and you're the seller right now and you say, you know, I want $100,000 down. They're putting 20% down. I want that up front as a deposit. And you guys go back and forth. Mm -hmm. And finally, you get something else because they say, you know, we're just not prepared to put down that kind of money. Why well, are they not pre-approved? Are they not serious? You know, yeah. you, might, you might pull the red herring a little bit to get something else that you want. Well, I'll tell you what, give us our possession day then and we'll accept, you know, a lesser deposit. Yeah. And, and it, can, it can be a way that um, helps bring them around to your point, um, you know, in, in a way that is, uh, you know, has a little bit more, like I said, of a showmanship to it. I agree. And, and that's worth clarifying too, because 
you're no, you don't want to throw stuff into an offer that's just going to make it cluttered and exactly. confusing. Yeah. Um, so using that deposit, if you flip it the other way, you're planning to put in a low deposit and then you can sweeten the offer after you're negotiating and say, okay, well, we'll bump up our deposit to this amount. And exactly. It, so there's ways to use the traditional terms and conditions within the offer to structure it to make it look better. Yeah, they were taught at, uh, um, I know, Rain way back when, the Real Estate Investment Network, every single offer had a lawnmower in it. Well, we don't have a lawnmower. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted a brand new Toro, Toro lawnmower, and eventually, <laughs> yeah. like, they were just writing them in, but they would do that. Or people that want to, and I'm no offense to anybody else that does this, wants to negotiate appliances and leaves the washer and dryer out, yeah. drives me up the wall because you could have a deal literally a crater on this. Well, it gives you an opportunity to do that. You can do it if it's like a red herring, a classic thing. But as soon as the deal starts teetering on appliances, I don't work for trail appliances. I'm not an appliance salesman. I want to sell homes. Mm -hmm. And I don't want a uh, you know, $1,200 dishwasher to, or a washer and dryer to try to affect an offer right. on a five or $600,000 place. So talking about that, you've got uh, yeah. creating additional value strategies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so as we're queuing each other to go along, now, <laughs> Lindsay, your next point was, thank you. Um, we talked about the standpoint of it's not always about price and it's not always about, um, well, it's just period. It's not always about price, you know, and that's just, a, that's just the end of a statement. So one of the things you want to make sure you do is figure out what, can, what are all the ways possible that you can add value to this transaction. So let's say a, the, the house is vacant and the seller wants a quick, a, a quick possession because they have all these holding costs. But the buyer doesn't want, is, isn't selling their house for a little while, they're not gonna have the money for a little while. Why can't the buyer take possession as a tenant to pay for the monthly costs and then come up with a lump sum at the end of the three month possession date? You still get paid your commissions, everyone's happy, but it's these creative things, like we talked about the contract or anything else, that can bring more value to the transaction overall. Anytime we talk about negotiation, there's two steps. Number one, you want to make the pie larger. Is there a possibility to add more value to the transaction overall? Let's throw a tenancy at will on the table or become a tenant. Let's throw improvements and renovations. Let's throw furniture in. Let's throw all these different types of stuff. Now you have all these tools to pull from, and then now you decide now you've created the pie larger, how do you slice it up appropriately? So you create value, and then you go through the claiming value portion of that. But if realtors are just on price, and that's it, then the box is this big mm -hmm. that they're operating within, and more deals will fall apart because you can't have a creative conversation that tries to meet more of the other side's goals. Um, if any of this stuff doesn't, it sounds foreign, uh, I would recommend taking the contracts course, figuring out what you can put in without throwing up red flags as well. That's um, right, because absolutely. How you structure a contract can actually throw up red flags if you throw in too much stuff and lenders are like, whoa, 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 I yeah. thought we're lending on a, a property. So that's right. Um, yeah, but it, fantastic points. So. Well, you come in and you say, oh, I want, I want the roof done and the roof is going to be uh, $15,000 for a new roof. And the guy says, no way, I can get the roof done for you know, 10. Right. Well, great, we'll do it. Yeah. Give me the house with the new roof. Perfect. Like, and then that's yeah. it. Then you save five thousand, and we're all talking about this. If you could, if Mr. and Mrs. Seller, if you think you're so good at doing the roof, then finish the and roof. Done. So yeah. there you go. Um, all right. Uh, this is deferring authority. Uh, yeah. Make somebody else the bad guy. Tell us about that. I love this. I love making the other or somebody else the bad guy and, and befriending the agent that you're working with to try and get a deal together. Yeah. Uh, because we're only messengers. We don't control what happens. Uh, it was actually Ron Stater uh, who explained to me years ago, um, realtors are the shock absorbers and we can take the information out and, and communicate it effectively. Whether or not that shock is coming from your clients, I rate that these guys came totally. in $90,000 under uh, and it's just making the other person the bad guy so you can befriend the other person and get them willing to work on the same page as you. Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. Um, so yeah, and, and that's a popular one that you actually see in car sales, and I don't mean to, it, like, I don't want to cheapen the perception of it, but it's true. They always go through and they say, well, I need to talk to my sales manager about mm -hmm. that. Let me just go down the hall and talk to my sales manager. It's the same thing. You do have to talk to your client about it. But when someone comes in, it's like, you know what, um, my client is looking at this comparable and is listening to the news um, that we're in a declining market or that things are leveled out and the price of oil might drop even more. And you guys want us to overpay, or the, the perception of it, he feels like he's overpaying still. So help me come back to my client with some information here mm -hmm. that's going to convince them otherwise. 
and, and that's where you know, you're deferring that power to your client. Right. Um, so making the bad guy, I like that a lot. Most people want to work together to get a deal done. Absolutely. Um, occasionally you run into that old school agent that really is that I'm going to win, you're going to lose. Yeah. And, and, here's, and my, my next point on this one is this concept of preconditioning. And I want you guys to precondition um, everything you do in the offer. And what I mean by that is this, is that you can go in and you can say, you know what, um, let's, I'm, I'm going to give you guys this offer or we're going to, um, you know, before you write an offer, let me just tell you, we know the carpet needs replacing. We know the roof um, has five years left on its lifespan. Mm -hmm. um, we know that the comparable down the block sold for this, and this is how we priced our home. Um, I also want to try to avoid, is it fair to just say that we all want to play, pay market value for this home? Because my clients are totally willing to sell it for market value if your clients are willing to pay. Is that fair? And you just ask this realtor, and now he can't come back in his offer and say, well, we offered the price low because of the carpet. And this is like, I already told you that. Yeah. And my example of this is, <laughs> this is where I get my negotiating strategies from. Um, in the movie, Eight Mile, Eminem is up at the front doing his freestyle rap battle uh, at the end with the other guy, whatever his name is, Damon or whatever else the guy is. So he's sitting at the front, and, and suddenly, the, the deal with the rap battles are just making fun of each other. So Eminem starts off and says, I am why I did go to like this. I did grow yeah. up in projects. I did do this. I did do that. But I know something you know. And then it goes and says other stuff about him, but said everything about himself already. So when he turned the mic over to the other guy, he had nothing to say. Nothing to say. He just took the words right out of his mouth and classic mic drop situation. Yeah. But when you precondition an offer and say, here, here's everything that we know. So bring your offer. We look forward to seeing it. And then now, the guy's got nothing to stand on, so it's one of my favorite things, preconditioning. I gotta say, I didn't see Eminem coming up in this meeting. Well, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure, there you go. Um, cool, finish us off, Steve. Uh, last point, I never wanna be the one to walk away from an offer. So true. Uh, it's way harder to say, no, we don't have a deal, than to counter the same counter that you did before. And you can do that, yeah. and say, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you guys sleep on it, our offer still stands. How many times have you seen people change their mind yep. in the morning? Yeah. And even your client might come back, all right, Steve, you know, give that extra $1,000 yep. or 2500 and let's just pull this thing together. I've, I've seen it where you expect them to take the night and sleep on it and expecting a counter and they just accept all right. That's right. And you're like, well, that worked. Yes. <laughs> so. and, and agents get so caught up on these timelines in the offer, and you do want to respect the fact that when that, t when that offer expires, um, possibly everyone could walk away and no deal has been done. No mm -hmm. one can sign anymore, so the deal is technically dead. Yep. But most times, sellers still want to sell, buyers still want to buy, no. and these deals come together. Agreed. Cool. Steve, thank you so much for your insights on that. Um, and we are going to be back talking about some subject property um, research and how to turn over all the rocks right after our best my nest and introducing some of our new realtors. Stick with us.